the play takes about an hour and five minutes, ten minutes maybe, and then there'll be a 15 minute intermission. Uh, there'll be music, we'll be continuing to do things on the stage to get ready for the second half. There will be refreshments upstairs. Um, please uh, turn off your cell phones if you have cell phones. And if you need a bathroom, you can go out the back door and just um, up those stairs because this is part of the world of our play. And um, thank you. This play is called Our Town. It was written by Thornton Wilde. The name of our town is Grover's Corners in Hampshire, just over the line from Massachusetts. The first act shows a day in our town. The date is May 7th, 1901. The skies begin to show some streaks of light in the east there, back of our mountain. Morning star always gets one little break, just a minute before it has to go. Well, now I'll show you how our town lies. Up here is Main Street. There's the grocery store, Mr. Morgan's drugstore. Most everybody in town manages to look into these once a day. Here's our doctor's house, Doc Gibbs. Here's the back door. Here's a bench. For those of you who feel they must have some scenery. This is Mrs. Gibbs' garden. Corn, peas, beans, hollyhocks, heliotrope, and a lot of burdock. Now, in those days, my newspapers came out twice a week. The Grover's Corner is Sentinel. And this is Editor Webb's house. This is Mrs. Webb's garden. Just like Mrs. Gibbs, only it's got a lot of sunflowers, too. Nice town, you know what I mean? Nobody very remarkable ever come out of it, as far as we know. The earliest dates on the tombstones up in the cemetery say 1670. Well, it's early morning. The only lights on the town are in a little cottage, down by the tracks, where a Polish mother's just had twins. And in the Joe Kroll house, where Joe Jr.'s getting ready to deliver the morning paper. And now the video, where Shorty Hawkins is getting ready to fly the 5.45 train to Boston. There she is. Well, another day's done. Here comes Doc Gibbs now, coming down Main Street, coming back from that baby case. And here's Mrs. Gibbs, come downstairs to make breakfast. Here comes Mrs. Webb, I'm now get her breakfast too. There's Joe Kroll, delivering Mr. Webb's sentiment. Morning, Doc. Morning, Joe. Are you going to Doc? Nah, uh, Eric went over to Polish Town. How's your name? What? Well, you like you said, it always tell me when it's going to rain. And what's it telling you today? Gonna rain? No, sir. Sure? Yes, sir. Did he ever make a mistake? No, sir. Get up, Bessie! What's the matter with you? Here comes Howie Yusuf delivering the morning milk. <laughs> morning, Doc! Morning, Howie. Is somebody sick? Uh, Pair of twins over Mrs. Scourge Lost Chief. Twins? Town's getting bigger every year. <laughs> What's it gonna do today, Howie? Gonna rain? Nah, no, nah, no, fine day. We'll burn through. Morning, Howie. Good morning, Mrs. Gibbs. Doc's just coming down the street. Where is he? Doc? Howie? Children! Children, time to get up! Come on, Bessie. Everything all right, Frank? Yes, I declare. Easy as kids. <laughs> George, Rebecca! They can't be ready in a minute. Sit down and drink your coffee. You can catch a couple of hours sleep this morning, can't you? All told, Frank, you won't get more than three hours sleep. Frank Gibbs, I don't know what's going to become of you. I do wish you could go away someplace and get some rest. I think it'll do you good. Wally, time to get up! Emily, 7 o'clock! I declare, Frank, you've got to speak to George. I don't know what's come over him lately, but he's no help to me at all. He won't even chop me some wood. Is he sassy to you? No. All he thinks about is that baseball. <clears throat> George, Rebecca, you're going to be late! George, look sharp! Yes, Paul. George! Don't you hear your mother calling for you? Wally! You'll be late for school! 
I, I guess I'll go upstairs and take 40 winks. Wally, you wash yourself good or I'll come up and do it myself. Mom, put trash down there. Don't make a noise. Father's been out all night and needs his rest. I washed and ironed that blue dress for you special. Oh, Mom, I hate that dress. Mom, hush up with you. How Rebecca comes to have so much money. She has more than a dollar. I would say that gradual. Seems to me spending money every now and then is a good thing. Mama, do you know what I love most in the world? Do you? Money! Dr. Gibbs. And then he wormed his way into my parlor, and Myrtle Webb, he offered me $350 for Grandmother Wentworth's high boy as I'm sitting here. Why, Julia Gibbs! He did! The old thing! Well, you're going to take it, aren't you? I, I don't know. You don't know? $350? What's come over you? Well, if I could get the doctor to take it and go away someplace and take a rest, I'd sell it like that. Oh, it's been a dream of my life to go see Paris, France. Oh, I know, it seems crazy, I suppose. But for years I've promised myself that if I ever got the chance, how's the doctor feel about it? Well, I did read about the bush a little and said that if I ever cut a legacy, that's how I put it, I'd make him take me. Hmm, what did he say? Oh, well, you know how he is. I haven't heard a single serious word out of him since the day we met. No, he says. It might make him discontent with Grover's corner to go traipsing about Europe. <laughs> Better let well enough alone, he says. Every two years, he goes and visits the battlefields of the Civil War. And that's enough treat for anybody, he says. <laughs> well, if that second-hand man's really serious about buying it, Julia, you sell it. Then you'll get to see Paris, all right. Just keep dropping hints from time to time. That's how I got to see the Atlantic Ocean, you know. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm sorry I mentioned it. Only it seems to me that once in your life before you die, you ought to see a country where they don't speak in English and don't even want to. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, ladies. Now we'll skip a few hours. But first, we need a little more information about our town. Kind of a scientific account, you might say. May I introduce Professor Willard of our state university? Just a few brief notes, Professor. Unfortunately, our time is limited. Groover's <laughs> <laughs> corners. Hmm. Let 
me see. Grover's Corners lies on the old Pliocene granite of the Appalachian Range. I may say that it is some of the oldest land in the world. We're very proud of that here. Of course, there are some more recent outcroppings. Sandstone, showing through a shelf of Devonian basalt. Shall I read some of Professor Gruber's notes on the meteorological situation, mean precipitation, etc.? I'm afraid we won't have time for that, Professor. The, the population. Within the town limits, 2,640. Uh, just a moment, Professor. Oh, yes. The population is now 2,642. <laughs> Thank you very much, Professor. I'm sure we're all very much obliged. Not at all, sir. Not at all. Now for the political and social report. Editor Webb. Mr. Webb is the editor and publisher of our Congress Corner Sentinel. That's our local paper, you know. Well, I don't have to tell you. We're all run by the Board of Slayers. <clears throat> Males vote at the age of 21. Women vote indirect. We're lower <laughs> middle class. Sprinkled on professional men. 10% illiterate laborers. Politically, we're 86% Republican, 6% Democrat, 4% Socialist, rest indifferent. Religiously, we're 85% Protestant, 12% Catholic, rest indifferent. Have you any comments, Mr. Webb? Very ordinary town, if you ask me. A little bit better behaved than most, probably a lot duller, but our young people seem to like it well enough. 90% of them graduating out of high school settle down to live right here, even after going away to college. Is there anyone in the audience who would like to ask Mr. Webb any questions about our town? Is there much drinking in Glover's Corners? Well, ma'am, I don't know what you mean by much. Mm -hmm. Saturday nights, the farmhands meet down at Ellery Reno's stable in Hollersome. We've got one or two town drunks, but they're having remorses every time an evangelist comes to town. Right good first date, but you know, always was. Is there no one in town aware of social injustice and industrial inequality? Oh yes, everybody is. Something terrible. Seems like they spend most of their time talking about who's rich and who's poor. Then why don't they do something about it? Well, I don't know. Seems like we're all hunting like everybody else for a way the diligent and sensible can rise to the top and the lazy and quarrelsome sink to the bottom. But it ain't easy to find. Meantime, we do all we can to help those who can't help themselves. And those that can, we pretty much leave alone. Are there any other questions? Mr. Webb? Yes, ma'am. Mr. Webb, is there any culture or love of beauty in Grover's Corners? No, ma'am, there isn't much culture. <laughs> but maybe this is the place to tell you you've got a lot of pleasures of a kind here. We all like the sun coming up over the mountain in the morning, and the birds. We all notice a good deal about the birds and the change of the seasons. Yes, everybody knows about them. Thank you, Mr. Webb. Now we'll get back to the town. It's 2 o'clock. All 2,642 have had their lunches, and all the dishes have been washed. The children have gone back to school. Only a few buggies on Main Street. Horses doze in our kitchen posts. There's an air of early afternoon calm about the town. Doc Gibbs is in his office, tapping people, making them go, ah. And there's Mr. Webb, not this long. One man in his head takes the privilege to push his own bomb. <laughs> Emily, walk simply. Who do you think you are today? Oh, Papa, you're terrible. One day you tell me to stand up straight, and the next you call me names. I just don't listen to you. Oh, I never got a kiss from such a great lady before. <laughs> Hello, Emily. Hello. You made a fine speech in class. I worked awful hard on it. Gee, it's funny, Emily. My window up there can just see your head nice when you're doing your homework over to your room. Why, can you? You certainly do stick to it. I don't think I can sit still that long. I guess you must like school. I always feel it's something you have to stick to. Yeah. I don't mind it, really. It passes the time. Yeah. Well, what do you think, Emily? We might work out a kind of telegraph from your window to mine, and once in a while we may kind of pinch or two about one of those algebra problems. Not the answers, Emily. Of course not. Just a little bit. <laughs> well, I guess hints are allowed. So, uh, if you get stuck, George, you whistle to me, and I'll give you some hints. You're just naturally bright, I guess. I figure it's just the way a person's born. <laughs> but you see, I want to be a farmer. And my Uncle Luke said that whenever I'm ready, he can come over and start working on his farm. If I'm any good, it could just gradually happen. You mean the house and everything? Yeah. Well, better be getting out to the baseball field. Thanks for the talk, Emily. Good afternoon, Mrs. Webb. Good afternoon, George. So long, Emily. So long, George. Emily, come and help me string these beans for the winter. Well, George Gibbs let himself have a real conversation, didn't he? Why, he's growing up. How old would 
George be? Oh, I don't know. Let's see. He must be almost 16. Mama, I made a speech in class today, and I was very good. You must just say to your father at supper, what was it about? The Louisiana Purchase. It was like silk off a stool. I'm going to be making speeches the rest of my life. Are these big enough? Try and get them a little bigger if you can. Mama, will you answer me a question serious? Seriously, dear, not serious. Seriously, will you? Of course I will. Mama, am I good looking? Yes, of course you are. Both my children got good features. I'd be ashamed if they hadn't. Oh, Mama, that's not what I mean. What I mean is, am I pretty? I've already told you, yes. Now that's enough of that. You have a nice to have a pretty face. I've never heard of such foolishness. Oh, Mama, you never tell us the truth about anything. I am telling you the truth. <laughs> Mama, were you pretty? <laughs> yes. I was, if I do say it. I was the prettiest girl in town, next to Mamie Cartwright. But you've got to say something about me. Am I pretty enough to get anybody, to get people interested in me? Emily, you make me tired. Now stop it. You're pretty enough for our normal purposes. <laughs> now let's get back to the orders. quarters. It's early evening. Uh, 
How many of you will be able to come in Tuesday afternoon to sing at Fred Hersey's wedding? Show your hands. <laughs> That's fine. That'll be right nice. Uh, once again now, art thou weary? Art thou languid? It's a question, ladies and gentlemen. Make it talk. <laughs> Could you come down a minute? Yes, talk. And remember, on uh, Sunday, you take the second verse very soft and sort of die out at the end. Alright? <laughs> One, two, three, four. Art thou weary? Art thou weary? Art thou weary? Art thou so distressed? <laughs> How old are you? Me? I'm 16, almost 17. And what do you plan to do when the school's over? Why, well, you know, Pa. I want to be a farmer on Uncle Luke's farm. Okay. You'd be willing, will you, to get up early and milk and feed the stock and hoe with pay all day? Why, sure. What do you mean, Pa? Well, George, while I was in my office today, I heard a funny sound. And what do you think it was? It was your mother chopping wood. <laughs> you can see your mother getting up early, cooking meals all day long, washing and ironing, and still she has to go out into the backyard and chop wood. I suppose she just got tired of asking and she just gave up and decided it was easier to do it herself. And you eat her meals, and you put on the clothes she keeps nice for you, and you run off and play baseball like she's some hired girl and keep her around the house, but that we don't like very much. <laughs> well, I know all I have to do is bring attention to it. Uh, have a handkerchief, son. <laughs> George, uh, I've decided to raise your spending money 25 cents a week. Not, of course, for chopping wood for your mother because that's the sort of present you give her. But because you're getting older, and I imagine there are lots of things you must find to do with it. Thanks, Paul. Let's see. Tomorrow's pay. You can count on it. I uh, wonder what could have happened to your mother. Choir practice never was as late as this before. It's only half past eight, Paul. Uh, I don't know why she's in that old choir anyway. She hasn't got any more voice than an old crow. You will break you on the streets at this hour of the night. <laughs> Uh, about time you retire, don't you think? Yes, Paul. <laughs> Oh, isn't 
Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> what were the girls talking about tonight? Well, believe me, Frank, there was something to gossip about. Hmm. Simon Stimson, far gone, was he? Worst I've ever seen him. Frank, how will it end? Dr. Ferguson can't forgive him forever. I don't know how it'll end, but there's nothing we can do but just leave it alone. What are you worried about? Well, I think it's my duty to make plans to make sure you get real rest and change. And if I get that legacy, I'm going to insist on it. Now, Julia, there's no sense in going over that again. Frank, you're just unreasonable. Come on, Julia. It's getting late. First thing you know, you'll catch cold. <laughs> I gave George a piece of my mind tonight, and I reckon you'll have your wood chopped for a while. <laughs> no, no, no. Start getting upstairs. Get out, Rebecca. There's only room for one at this window. Well, let me look just a minute. Use your own window. I did, but there's no moon there. George, do you know what I think, do you? <coughs> I think maybe the moon's getting near and near, and there'll be a big explosion. Rebecca, you don't know anything. If the moon were getting near, then the men who stay up all night with their telescopes would see it, and they'll tell us about it, and it'd be all the newspapers. George, is the moon shining on South America, Canada, and half the whole world? Probably is. Nine thirty. Most of the lights in town are out. Miss Constable Warren, trying a few doors on Main Street. He comes out of their web after putting his newspaper to bed. It's pretty good, Bill. Hey, Mr. Webb. What a move. Yeah. All quiet tonight? Someone still is coming from the web. Just saw his wife turning out to look for him, so I looked at the other web. <laughs> there he is now. Good evening, Simon. Good evening. Yes? Most of the town's turned in for the night. Maybe we better do the same. Can I walk with you a ways? <laughs> Good night, Simon. I don't know how that's going to end, Mr. Webb. <laughs> One thing after another. Oh, Bill, you see my boy smoking cigarettes. He give him a word. He really thinks a lot of you. I don't think he smokes no cigarettes, Mr. Webb. At least weighs not more than two or three a year. I hope not. <laughs> Who's up there? Is that you, Myrtle? No, it's me, Papa. Aren't you in bed? I don't know. I can't sleep yet, Papa. The moonlight's so wonderful. And the smell of Mrs. Gibbs' heliotropes. Can you smell it? Yes. I haven't got any troubles on your mind, have you, Emily? Troubles, Papa? No. Well, don't let your mother catch you. Good night, Emily. Good night, Papa. I never told you about the letter Jane Crawford got from her minister when she was sick. He wrote Jane a letter, and on the envelope, the address looked like this. It said, Jane Crawford, the Crawford Farm, Grover's Corner, Sutton County, New Hampshire, United States of America! What's so funny about that? Well, listen, it's not finished. United States of America, continent of North America, Western Hemisphere, the Earth, the Solar System, the Universe, the Mind of God! That's what it said on the envelope! <laughs> <laughs> yep, and the postman brought it just to see! <laughs> <laughs> Three years have gone by. The sun's come up over a thousand times. Some babies that weren't even born before have begun to talk in regular sentences already. A number of people who thought that they were right young and spry have begun to notice that they can't bound up a flight of stairs that they used to without their hearts buttoning a little bit. Nature's been pushing and contriving in other ways, too. A number of our young people fell in love and got married. Seems like most everybody in the world gets married. You know what I mean? And in our town, there ain't hardly no exception. It seems like most everybody climbs into their grave married. So, 
Three years have gone by. It's 1904. It's July 7th, just after high school commencement, which is right about the time most of our young people jump up and get married. It's early morning again, only this time it's been raining. It's been pouring and thundering. And here comes Mrs. Gibbs, Mrs. Webb, come downstairs to make breakfast, just as if this were an ordinary morning. Now, I don't need to point out to the ladies in the audience that both these women they see before them, both these women have cooked three meals a day, every day, one for 40 years and the other for 20, and no summer vacations. They raised two children apiece, washed, cleaned a house, and never had a nervous breakdown. Never felt themselves hard used either. It's like, what one of those Western poets said. You've got to have life to love life, and you've got to love life to have life. It's what they call a vicious circle. <laughs> Here comes Hallie Newsom and Nessa, deliver at the mill. There's Cy Kroll, delivering the papers like his brother before. Morning, Hallie. Oh, morning, Cy. You doing the paper ads, you know? Nothing much. Except for losing about the best baseball pitch of Rover's Corners ever had. I uh, reckon he is. Now all he'll be doing is pitching head. He get hit from one base is two. How do you find ball player? Howdy. Will you ever give up a thing like that just to get married? I can't tell, Cy. I never had no talent that way. Morning, Howdy. Well, oh, hello, Bill. You're up early. Morning, Mr. Warren. Yeah, then out. See if there's anything I can do to prevent a flood. The river's been rising all night. Sack Crowell here's all broke up about George Gibbs retirement from baseball. Yes, sir, that's the way it goes. Nope. Ouch. Good morning, Miss Gibbs. Good morning, Howie. Too bad about the weather. It's been raining so hard that maybe it'll clear up. Certainly hope it will. How much do you want today? Well, I'll be having a house full of relations, so it looks to me like I'll be needing three milk and two cream. Three milk and uh, two cream. My wife says to tell you we hope they'll be happy. No, they will. Thanks, Howie. Tell her we hope she gets to the wedding. Oh, she'll get there if she's good. Good morning, Miss Webb. Good morning, Howie. I told you four tarts of milk, but I hope you can spare me another. Yes, ma'am. Uh, four tarts and two or three. <coughs> Will it start raining again, Howie? Well, I was just telling Miss Gibbs how it's how it make you off. Oh, Mrs. Newsom told me special to tell you is how we hope they'll be happy. No, they won't. Thank you, and thank Mrs. Newsom. And we're counting on seeing you at the church. Yes, I'm going to get there, all right. Couldn't miss that. Come on, Bessie. Well, Mom, the day has come. You are losing one of your chicks. Don't say another word, Frank Gibbs. I feel like crying every minute. Sit down and drink your coffee. The groom's up shaving himself. Only, there ain't an awful lot to shave. <laughs> Whistling and singing like he's glad to leave us, and every now and then he says, I do. <laughs> <laughs> it don't sound convincing to me. I think, Frank, I don't know how he'll get along. I've arranged his clothes, seen to his feet are dry, that he has warm clothes on, you're too young, Frank. And we won't think of such things. Who catches death of cold within a week? <laughs> How'd you sleep last night, Julia? <laughs> I heard a lot of hours struck up. Yeah, I still get a shock every time I think of George setting up to be a family man. That great gangling thing. I tell you, Julia, there's nothing more terrifying in the world than a son. The relation between father and son is the damnedest, awkwardest. Well, mother and daughter don't no pick me either, let's tell you. <laughs> they don't have a lot of troubles, I suppose, but then everyone has the right to their own troubles. Yes. People were meant to live two by two. Take natural to be lonesome. <laughs> Julia, did you know one of the things I was scared of when I married you? Go on with you. 
I was afraid we wouldn't have material for conversation more in the last a few weeks. I was afraid we'd run out and eat our meals in silence. That's a fact. Well, uh, you and I have been conversing for 20 years now, and uh, without any notable bearing spells. Well, good weather, bad weather, ain't <laughs> no choice. But I always find something to say. <laughs> Do you hear Rebecca staring about upstairs? No. Um, only day of the year Rebecca hasn't been managing everybody's business. Uh, she's hiding in her room. I have a feeling she's crying. Lord sakes, this has got to stop. Rebecca, Rebecca, come and get your breakfast. Good morning, everybody. Only four more hours to live. <laughs> <laughs> Step across the grass and see my girl. Perhaps Mrs. Webb isn't used to visitors at seven in the morning. Be back in a minute. Morning, Mother Webb. Morning, George. Goodness, you frightened me. Now, George, I hate to say it, you can stand here a minute out of the rain. But really, you understand, George. I can't ask you if. Why not? You know well as I do, the groom can't see his bride on his wedding day. Not until he sees her at church. Uh, that's just superstition. Good morning, Mr. Webb. Oh, good morning, George. Mr. Webb, you don't believe in superstition, do you? Well, there's a lot of common sense in superstition, George. <laughs> <laughs> How simply? She hasn't waked up yet. I haven't heard a sound out of her. She's asleep? No wonder. We were up till all hours, sewing and packing. Now, I'll tell you what I'll do, George. You sit down here with Mr. Webb and drink this cup of coffee, and I'll run upstairs and see if she don't come down and surprise you. There's some bacon, too. Don't be long about it. <laughs> oh, George, how are you? I'm fine. <laughs> Mr. Webb, what common sense could there be behind superstition like that? Well, George, on a wedding morning, a girl's head is full of, well, you know, clothes and one thing and another. Don't you think that's probably it? <laughs> yeah, I didn't think of that. <laughs> the girls act like they're my nervous on the wedding day, George. I wish a person could get married with all that, all that marching up and down. <laughs> Every man that's ever lived has felt that way, George. <laughs> <laughs> it hasn't been any use. It's the women who built up weddings, my boy. Well, you believe in it, don't you, Mr. Webb? Yes. Oh, yes, yes, now. <laughs> you got married? Well, I had just been to college, and I took some time to settle down, but Mrs. Webb wasn't much older than what Emily is now. Oh, but age hasn't got much to do with it, George, not compared with other things. What were you going to say, Mr. Webb? Oh, I don't know. Was I going to say something? <laughs> George, I was remembering the other night the advice my father gave to me on my way. Yes, he said. Charles, he said, start right off showing her who's boss. Give her an order, even if it don't make any sense. Just so she'll learn to obey. <laughs> then he said, if anything about her irritates you, her conversation or anything, get right up and leave the house. That'll make it clear to her. <laughs> oh, yes, and uh, then he said, never let your wife know about how much money you have. <laughs> never. Well, I couldn't exactly. So I took the opposite of his advice, George. And I've been happy ever since. So, let that be a lesson to you. Never take advice from anyone on personal matters. Never. Are you going to raise chickens on your farm? What? Are you going to raise chickens on your farm? Oh, well, Uncle Luke doesn't have any, but I figured reading it Yeah. A book came into my office the other day on the filing system of raising chickens. I wish you'd read it. I'm thinking of beginning in a small way myself in the backyard. I can have an incubator to sell Charles it. Charles Webb! Are you talking about that incubator again? I thought you two would be talking about things worthwhile. Well, Myrtle, you want to give the boys some good advice, I'll go upstairs. <laughs> George, Emily's got to come down and eat her breakfast. She sends you her love, but she doesn't want to lay her eyes on you. Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs> Guess no one told you about the even older superstition. What do you mean, Charles? Since the caveman. The bridegroom should never see the father-in-law on the day of the wedding. <laughs> <laughs> Now, I have to interrupt again here. 
You see, we want to know how this all began, this wedding, this plan to spend a lifetime together. <coughs> I'm very interested in how big things like that begin. You know how it is. You're 21 or 22, you make a few decisions, and then whoosh, you're 70 years old. You've been a lawyer for 50 years, and that white-haired lady by your side has eaten over 50,000 meals with you. <laughs> how do such things begin? <laughs> George and Emily are going to show you now the conversation they had when they first knew that, as the saying goes, they were meant for one another. But before they do that, I'd like you to try and remember what it was like when you were very young, and particularly the days when you were first in love. You're just a little bit crazy. Can you remember that? <laughs> now, they'll be coming out of high school at 3 o'clock. George has just been elected president of the senior class, and as this is June, that means he'll be president of the senior class all next year. Emily has been elected Secretary and Treasurer. Oh yeah, here they come, down Main Street now. Emily, can I carry your books up for you? Oh yeah, thank you. It isn't far. I'm awful glad you were elected too, Emily. Thank you. Emily, why are you mad at me? I'm not mad at you. You've been treating me so funny lately. Well, since you asked, I might as well say it right now, George. I don't like the whole change that's come over you this past year. I'm sorry if it hurts your feelings, but I've got to... Emily, what do you mean? Well, up to a year ago, I used to like you a lot. And I used to watch you while you did everything, because we've been friends so long. And then you began spending all your time on baseball, and you never stopped to speak to anybody anymore. Not even to your own family, you didn't. And George, it's a fact. Ever since you've been elected captain, you've got almost stuck up and conceited. And all the girls say so, and it hurts me to hear him say it. But i got to agree with them a little, because it's true. Gee. I... I never thought that such a thing was happening to me. I guess it's hard for a fellow not to have some faults creep into his character. Well, I always expect a man to be perfect, and I think he should be. No, I don't think so. <laughs> well, my father is, and as far as I can see, your father is. There's no reason on earth why you shouldn't be, too. Well, I think it's the other way around. That men are naturally good, but girls are. Well, you might as well know right now that I'm not perfect. It's not as easy for a girl to be as perfect as a man. Because, well, we girls are more nervous. Now, I'm sorry I said all that about you. I don't know what made me say it. Emily. And I know it's not the truth at all. And I suddenly feel it's not important anyway. Emily. Well, would you like an ice cream soda or something before you go home? Why, thank you, George. I, I, I would. Hello, George. Hello, Emily. What do you have? Why, uh, Emily, what? What have you been crying about? Oh, she got an awful scare, Mr. Morgan. That, uh, that hardware store wagon almost ran over her. Everybody says Tom Puckins drops like a crazy man. <laughs> Here, take a good drink of water. <laughs> you look all shook up. I tell you, I look both ways before you cross Main Street these days. It gets worse every year. What do you have? I'll have a strawberry phosphate, no, no. Mr. Morgan. Emily, have a soda with me. Two strawberry ice cream sodas, Mr. Morgan. Two strawberry ice cream sodas, yes, sir. There you are. They're so expensive. No, no, don't you think of that, Emily. We're celebrating. Oh, that should happen. And then do you know what else I'm celebrating? No. I'm celebrating because I've got a friend who tells me all the things that ought to be told. Oh, George, please don't think of that. I don't know what made me say it. It's not no, true. No, Emily, You're... you stick to it. I'm glad you spoke to me like you did, but you'll see, I'm going to change so quick. You bet I'm going to change. And Emily, I want to ask you a favor. What? If I go away to agricultural school next year, would you write me a letter once in a while? I certainly will. I certainly will, George. I will try and make the letters interesting. You see, whenever I meet a new farmer, I ask him if he thinks it's important to go to agricultural school to be a good farmer. Why, George? Yeah. And some of them even say it's a waste of time. You can get all that information anyways in the pamphlets the government sends out. Uncle Luke's getting old. He's about ready for me to start taking over the song tomorrow if I could. My! Yeah, yeah. Well, I think that's just as important as college is. Yes, George? Emily, if I do improve, <laughs> I make a big change. Would you, would you be, I mean, could you be? I, I am now, and I've always been. Well, I guess it's an important talk we've been having. <laughs> Wait.
would just admit and I'll walk you home. <laughs> Mr. Morgan, I'll have to get the money to pay for this later. <laughs> uh, George gives, do you mean to tell Yes, me? yes, but I had reasons. Look, keep my gold watch until I come back with the money. Oh, keep, keep your watch, George. I'll trust you. I'll be back in five minutes. I'll trust you in ten years, George, when I pay you for it. Got all over your shop, Well, yes, Mr. Morgan, it was nothing. Well now, on to the wedding. <coughs> <laughs>